The deep darkness of late November, um, I was here with you on a Sunday, um, and for those of you who don't remember, which I, I, I entirely forgive you, I probably would have forgotten myself, um, I'm, I'm the curate at St. Hugh's Church in Lucy Farm, and um, I've been there for a few years, and um, I have a kind of three-line bio, which is how I try, try and sort of summarize everything that happened to me sort of over the last 15 years or so. Um, I trained to be a barrister. Um, then I ran a laser quest. Um, and then I worked um, as, a, as a project manager in, in the city of London. And um, out of all of that, God called me um, to become part of leading in his church. And... Um, when I came last time, I wonder if anybody remembers um, what it was that I talked about. Because I'm, I'm very conscious standing here that it seems that I'm popping up um, at really significant moments for you as a gathered body of Christ, as, as the church here on the Bushmead Estate. Um, the last time that I came on a Sunday, um, Glyn had just left. It was the Sunday after that. Do you remember? Do you remember the look on your faces that morning when I first arrived? Because I do. And the look on your faces was generally something like this. <laughs> and I was pleased that by the time we'd spent the morning together, something seemed to have slightly lifted. But you've been having a very, a very interesting experience over the last few months. Every week, you've been having someone come down, someone different, opening up the scriptures, opening up the word, leading you in inevitably slightly different ways. It's just natural, isn't it? I pray that the Holy Spirit has been working through that and that you've been feeling a direction that he has been leading you in. And we need that, don't we? But inevitably, I think, you must be feeling to a degree that you've gone a little bit this way, and then a little bit this way, and maybe a little bit this way. <laughs> maybe just occasionally you felt like you might have gone backwards. Shh, I didn't say that. And stepping on. I wonder what, if you remember what I said when I was last here. When I was last here, the line that I, that I gave you was that it's time to get in the river. And I, and I told you that story from, from the middle of Ezekiel, where, uh, where there's this vision that Ezekiel has of a river flowing from the temple of God, from the throne of God, and it flows down out of the temple. And as it comes further and further away from the temple. Ezekiel's kind of walking along the river. And as he does that, it gets deeper and deeper and wider and wider. The further away from the temple it goes. And it goes down and it irrigates and refreshes and brings life to the whole of the land. I wonder whether you feel like you've been experiencing that in this season. Or I wonder, to put it in another way, which I think is the way that I'd like to put it today. Are you hungry? Well, are you? Who's hungry? Who had their breakfast this morning? Yeah? What did you have? An orange? Yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah? Porridge and dates. Oh, very, very healthy. Keep you very regular. <laughs> Anyone beat porridge and dates? Yeah? Porridge as well. All bran. Cranberries. Yeah? A biscuit bar. Very, very quick. Very immediate. Um, anybody, 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 anybody have a fry up this morning? No. What did you have? An apple. I'm not very good with breakfast. I, I, I tend to sort of sometimes have it, have a cup of coffee, sometimes skip it. I didn't have breakfast this morning. 
bar a cup of coffee. It's not great, is it? It's supposed to be the best meal of the day, most important. But you might be feeling hungry. And you also, as I continue to speak, um, depending on, and you'll have experienced this with different people who've been speaking here over the last um, few months, um, you know, some of you might start to feel hungry depending on the length of the talk. So I'm going to get on with it. Um, because I'm not really talking about food this morning. When I, when I talk about hunger, what I'm talking about is spiritual hunger. The Bible, in so many different places that it's impossible to recount all of them, uses hunger and thirst as an image, a picture. You know, I don't know, I don't know if you love bread as much as me, but that kind of hunk of bread really inspires something in my mind. It really gets me going. It, it, it might, if you're feeling hungry, kind of cause your mouth to just slightly fill with saliva. Oh, yeah, I really like that. But the Bible uses hunger as an image of our need and our desire for God. And here's, here's some other words that maybe, maybe kind of fill that, um, that, that same space um, in, our, in our mental landscape as, as, as hunger. Um, desiring, eager, craving, yearning, longing. To have appetite, keening. How hungry are you for God? That's the big question today. How hungry are you? How hungry are we as a church, as a, as a community of faith for God? And how can we grow that in ourselves? How can we grow that in our church? And how can we grow that in our community? Like I said, when I was last here, you had just begun that fresh season since Glynn. And I find myself here, and, and many of you will know this, that, um, that this week, um, those who were, who were nominated to be part of the process will be, will be shortlisting the candidates for, for, for Vicar of Christ Church. In the midst of all of that, in the midst of all of that change, all of those different directions, all of those little steps, are you remaining hungry for God? Now, I want to say a few things about hunger, spiritual hunger. Now, I don't normally do this, but I have some points. Do you like points? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm giving you a sort of a pre-warning about the, the pointy nature of these points. Um, because if you have a pen and a piece of paper, it might really actually help you in this context. Because otherwise you might not follow them. Um, but I'm going to try and do my best on this. Because, because I really like them. They really kind of bubbled up in me. When, when we started thinking about this... Um, because this is actually something that, that we've been thinking about um, as a church at St. Hughes um, over in Lizzie Farm as well. So the first one I want to make is that um, hunger, the opposite of spiritual hunger, is not really being full. You know that feeling that you have after your Christmas dinner and you're just like, oh, I, I couldn't eat another chipolata, you know, another bacon covered sausage I couldn't eat another thing that's not really the opposite of spiritual hunger the opposite of spiritual hunger is apathy it's not really feeling at all it's not feeling that desire it's that feeling that you sometimes have where you've kind of lost the feelings where you're not seeking after God anymore, where you're not hoping for his presence with you, where you're not seeking him in prayer, you're not spending time in the Bible. You maybe think that church sort of becomes a bit of an optional extra. Hunger actually stops that thing. I might call that apathy something like passivity. I don't know if you like that 
word passivity, being passive. Hunger stops that. There's a, there's a proverb that talks about that. Hunger gives energy. Proverbs 16, 26 says, The appetite of laborers works for them. Their hunger drives them on. There's something about hunger that kind of gives us an energy to kind of move forward. And if we don't have that, then we might stay still. Okay, so that's my first point. The second thing I want to say is that hunger is actually a sign of health. When you get sick, one of the first things that can often happen is that you lose your appetite. Your body might get a bit confused by the illness, by focusing on fighting it off. Maybe you've got a fever. Maybe you've got something else. But your body actually reaches a point where it, it's a bit confused, and it no longer realizes what it actually needs. Because obviously when you are sick, what you need is good food and drink, water and bread to, to, to help your body to heal. But you don't necessarily always feel that, do you? You lose your appetite. And it's important to realize that Jesus fasted. You know, um, Jesus said when he was in the desert, being tempted, fasting for 40 days, he quoted this passage, this Bible passage that we read. He said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, was that a sign of health or a sign of sickness? Well, we see it in Jesus. So I would say that was a sign of health. The other thing that I'd like to say about hunger is what it promotes above all else. Hunger promotes humility. You know, if we're hungry, I think we often realize at that moment that we aren't self-sufficient. That we can't just wall ourselves up and deal with everything with the resources that we have on our own. When we're hungry, we realize that actually the thing that we have in our hand isn't enough. We can't just get by on our own. And that we actually need to live dependent on God. There's a really important biblical story that's all around this whole issue. And it's that of the Exodus. Do you remember the people of Israel? They're walking through the desert. And they've come out of slavery. And God's done all of this stuff. And they, and they have all of this in their memory. But, but actually at that precise moment, they're destitute. And they're desperate. And they're lost. And they have nothing. And they have no food. And they cry out to God. And what does God provide? Manna from heaven. If you don't know the story really well, um, basically the, the, this kind of sort of crust of bread kind of forms on the desert floor during the night. And every day the people of Israel have to go out and collect it up. And they can't collect up more than they need because they can't store it because it doesn't last more than a day. They just have to keep going out day by day to meet their hunger day by day. Those words of Deuteronomy 8. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart.
when we take those different steps, you know, we take a step this way, and then we take a step that way, and then we take a step the other way, we can feel a bit lost. We can feel a bit humbled. We can feel a bit tested. But when God did that to the Israelites, what Deuteronomy 8 says is that it was to humble and to test you in order to know what was in your heart. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. That's the passage that Jesus quotes when he's in the middle of his hungry moment. In the middle of his test, in the middle of his trial, he remembers the story of the Israelites. And he remembers that God promotes hunger in us because of what it does in our hearts. It's not just something for them. It was something for Jesus, and it's something for us. So then the last point that I'd like to make about hunger is this one. There is hunger in each of our stories. In each of the stories that has led you into this building on this morning, there is hunger. What do I mean? You might remember the story of the prodigal son that Jesus told. It's in Luke 15, if you haven't read it. And, and in that story, a, a, a son who, who, is, who, is, who is in... Um, he gets kind of tired of living with his father. And he says, oh, I don't want to wait until you die to receive all the inheritance that, that, that you're going to give me. I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to take it now, and then I'm going to go. And his father's sad about this, but he, but he kind of says, okay, you can, you can do that. So, so the son heads off, spends all the money that he's received in, 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 in wild living, in just doing everything immediately, the first things that he can think of, satisfying all of his immediate desires. And then he ends up in a place where he has no money, no friends, no food. And he's forced to work in a pig farm. There's an amazing moment in that story where the son makes the choice to turn back to the father. The moment when he turns, it's not, it's not the most significant point, I don't think, is the moment when, when he reaches the father, when he gets back into the home, when he's welcomed back. I think the most amazing point is this. When he's in that place and he turns around and starts going back, Do you know what it was that drove him to do that? Hunger. He says, here I am. I'm starving to death. Even the servants in my father's house eat better than this. And I think that you probably all realize that there's hunger in each of your stories. There was a moment when you started that walk towards God. Don't we want that again? Don't we want to see that grow in us? The realization of our need for God. The energy that that gives us the apathy that that shifts aside, that it shovels out of our hearts. So I'm going to give us a moment to actually have a, have a chat about that, actually. Um, 
just with whoever you're sitting next to. And I've got a couple of questions, and I wonder if you can, you can talk to um, the person that you're sitting next to about them. Um, how hungry are you, given all that I've said? And, and this is a really interesting question for you at a moment when your church is changing. How hungry actually is your church? How hungry are you as a gathered body? So we'll, we'll just have a chat for, for two, three minutes or so, uh, just to wake us up. Then I'll say a few more things and then we'll finish, okay? So, I wonder um, how your conversations have gone, and, and please don't let me stop you carrying on your conversations um, later on, um, maybe over coffee. I think it's a fantastic thing to be able to talk to each other about, because we don't always ask each other, how hungry are you? Um, let me leave you, though, with a, with a few thoughts as to how, depending on how, you, how you've actually responded to that question, how hungry you feel you are before God. Maybe some of you feel, actually, yeah, no, actually, I have a deep and burning, abiding hunger for God at the moment. Maybe some of you feel, actually, actually, at the moment, I'm, I don't really feel like I'm that hungry for God. Well, if you're more in that camp or somewhere along the way, let me leave you with, with a couple of ideas and thoughts about how it is that we might cultivate that hunger for God in our lives. Now, if you're wanting to make yourself hungry, one of the things you might do is you might think about food. You ever have that moment when you, um, when you walk past the, the, the cake shop and you kind of look in and go, whoa, <laughs> and suddenly you feel the hunger rise? You might, you might see food. Or you might, and this one really gets me, you might see other people eating food. Did you ever have that thing where um, if, you, if you go on a picnic, like, I don't know whether you do this as a, as a church, whether you have kind of um, bring in shares or something, um, and, or, or church picnics, and, and you, see, you see the other family who have just kind of really gone to town. And you kind of look down at your, at your meager sandwiches. That makes you hungry, right? That makes you hungry. Well, we have, as the church, a gift from God that enables us to see him and to hear him in an amazing way. And it's the Bible. If you're ask, answering that question, how hungry are you? When was the last time that you read this? Not in church, maybe, but on your own. In it we see, on the pages, God's love writ large. We see him described. And when we read the Bible, it's kind of counterintuitive. The more we read it, the more hungry we become to read it. Another way that we can, we can, we can have that seeing and hearing is in prayer. If we spend time speaking to God, and we can be encouraged that he desires to speak to us. And what was it that Jesus said? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We can also practice his presence. Now this isn't necessarily the same as him speaking. It's the realization that he is there. It's the revelation that he is with us. And that's a promise that Jesus made. That he would send his spirit so that we wouldn't be alone. But how many times do we feel alone? How many times do we actually not feel him there? 
Well, spending time trying to cultivate that sense that we abide in him, that we live in him, that we live and breathe and have our being in him. That's something which cultivates hunger. Because when we have a relationship like that with God, we only want more. We only want more. But we don't do this all on our own. I mentioned watching other people eat. Community is important. Church is important. We don't do this on our own. And one of our responsibilities as church is to encourage hunger in each other, spiritual hunger. Hunger for the good things of God. Hunger that reminds us, reminds us of those moments in our own story and reminds us of those moments in the stories of other people where God has been close, so close. That promotes hunger. The other thing, the last thing that I want to suggest is that it promotes hunger to join in with the mission which God has for every one of us as his followers on this earth. The mission which he is ever doing and continuing in our world. The mission of bringing his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. When we start to step out and join in with those things, it's, like, it's a bit like spiritual exercise. You know if you exercise, you tend to get hungry? That's a bit like mission is. But mission doesn't have to be the big thing. It doesn't have to be the organized event. It doesn't have to be run in, with a crack team of 20 others. And it doesn't necessarily have to look like anything that you've seen done in other places or you've done before. Let me tell you a story about the last couple of weeks for me, which have been been a real joy in just discovering the way that the Holy Spirit can lift up a missional opportunity out of nothing. A couple of weeks ago, my wife, um, Rowena, and my son, Atticus, um, we're thinking about what had happened in New Zealand. You might remember a few weeks ago there was a terrorist attack in New Zealand um, where um, a man went into um, several mosques and shot over 50 people. And um, we were really conscious that when something like that happens, even though it's, it's a million miles away, it's, it's halfway around the other side of the world, that there are Muslim people in Luton, our neighbors, and in my case, literally my neighbor, who feel, if not afraid, a little bit less secure, a little bit less sure of their place, and a lot less loved than they did the day before. And my wife's response was, was, why don't we, her and, her and my four-year-old, why don't we make a little sign that we can put up in our window that says, we heart our Muslim neighbors, and then had a little cross to sort of show who it was from, where that thought had come from. And so, um, so they did that. It was just kind of you know, made out of stuck together A4 pages, just cut out. And that, to me, seems like a drop in the ocean. An insignificant gesture. Nothing. In comparison with what was lost, in comparison with what is felt. But do you know what? In some way, the Holy Spirit picked up the heart behind that. Our hunger to join in with the mission of God to love our neighbors, which is what Jesus commands, isn't it? So if we follow his commandments, we're joining in with his mission. The Holy Spirit picked that up and took it into places that I would never have imagined. So that was on the Friday. On the Sunday, 
It was fairly late at night, sort of 8, 8.30 in the evening. It was dark. There was a knock on the door, and I thought, oh, do I really want to answer the door at this time? I was already in my pajamas. I'm always tired on a Sunday evening, you know. Busy day. And I went to open the door, and there were two Muslim men standing there with two small children. And they said, we just felt like we had to come round and say how much your sign means to us. And we wanted to thank you for having put that up. And they didn't just say it. They brought round a pizza <laughs> and two pots of peri-peri chicken and the children had, um, they'd made a card. They, like, drawn and colored a card. And, and on, the, on the cover of it, it said, we are all friends. And then it had about 20 exclamation marks. <laughs> and I just thought, wow. How's this happened? So that week, I kind of lost count of, of the number of people who would stop me trying to get into my house because they just wanted to speak over. We're not far from the hospital. There's a lot of passing traffic. And they just wanted to say, oh, thank you. Thank you for putting that up. Again, it's a drop in the ocean. It's nothing. But a number of, um, a number of other churches in Luton heard the story, because I just, I just shared the story with them. And they said, wow, this is amazing. There's clearly something in some way that God is using this small thing. Let's do this. So around 20 to 30 churches around Luton now have banners. And you might have seen them driving around. They're little white and red banners. And they say, we heart our Muslim neighbors. You are not alone. From the churches of Luton. The next Friday... I got invited to our local mosque to come down for Friday prayers. Never been there before. How does the mission of God take me somewhere like that? We don't agree with them about everything. But we're called to love them. So I went down to the local mosque for Friday prayers. And they called me up to the front, and they said, thank you. And they gave me a gift, and then they gave me the mic. And I was able to tell them that we, as the Christian community in Luton, that we, as followers of Jesus, bearing his love, have love for them. Because Jesus loves them. Then a week later, I got invited on Inspire FM. Anyone ever listen to Inspire FM? Probably not. It's the Muslim radio station <laughs> in Luton. God takes these little things that we offer him in response to what's in our hearts. Our hunger for him our hunger for the love that he has for us, the heart that he has for us, and the heart that he has for our community. He takes these things, and then he fans them into flames. That's what his fire is. You know, we, say, we stand in church and we say, more fire, Lord. That's what his fire is. It's fanning into flames the gift of God that's within you. The things that he's put in your heart. And he can take it further than you ever imagined that he could. To see his kingdom come on the earth. But ultimately, we get this hunger for the things of God. We get this hunger for his mission from him. And the simplest way 
and probably the most important way to generate this hunger within yourself, to, to, to see this extended in your life, to see this grow, is to ask him. So that's what we're going to do now. Um, just as we, just as we, if we could all um, stand now, we're going to spend a few moments asking God if you like it. You don't have to. Maybe, maybe you really do think that you're already right up there. In which case, I guess we can pray that that continues. Because I don't know, in my life, I, my experience is certainly that my hunger doesn't stay at the same level. It goes through periods of ups, it goes through periods of downs. It responds to circumstances. It's affected by change. It's affected by my understanding of the vision of the Spirit at that particular time. It's affected by my relationship with the community that I'm in, the community of faith. It's affected by how much I've been spending time with God, how much I've been pressing in and hearing his word in the Bible, in prayer, in practicing his presence, in abiding in him. So if you'd like to, then just as we all bow our heads, no one's really paying attention to what anyone else is doing. Let's ask him in our hearts to come and increase our hunger for him. Jesus, give us a hunger for you. Give us a yearning for you. Give us an appetite for everything about you. I ask that you come by your spirit now and remove from us any apathy which we've been feeling about you or about our church or about our world. Ask that you'd replace that apathy in our hearts with your love. Pray that you would come by your spirit and make us aware of your presence. Abide in us, Lord. And I pray that you, in giving us this hunger, would also be giving us an energy, a fire, a wind at our back to go and to fulfill your mission to reach this world in your love. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And as we come to communion now, let's continue to go on feeding on him, receiving from him, asking him to feed us, to fill us, and to allow us to go on being filled and to cultivate that hunger within us.